So I'm going to begin today, and our general topic is institutions. And our central theme of the alternative institutional forms of the market economy. Now, whenever we approach this topic, we find that there is an elephant in the room. And we cannot proceed further without leading the elephant out of the room. The elephant is the concept of capitalism. So let me begin by asking you, what is capitalism? What is capitalism? Could someone volunteer? Everyone uses this term capitalism, so they must know what it means. What is, yes? Yes, but you haven't said what it is. What is capitalism? Uh, Can everybody hear? Yeah, Can you speak up? Well, you, you, you emphasize that it's a Marxist idea. And although Karl Marx didn't invent the word capitalism, it was thanks to him that it has come into general use. But in your statement just now, you didn't say what the distinctive attributes of this particular system are. Could, yes, further? Anyone else? Is there someone there in the back who's volunteering? Yes. Is there, do you use the marketplace to um, mediate markets or economic interaction uh, to fight, determine uh, like the value of, of goods uh, when the market could trade with goods and services? So you're equating the concept of capitalism with a market economy. I, th I thought that the, the sense of this first su suggestion was somewhat different, was more restrictive. Market economy has existed in many forms in history. In the main historical entities before the present age, which were the great agrarian bureaucratic empires of antiquity, the Chinese Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and so forth, there were characteristically long periods of a market economy. Often, it didn't survive very long. It went through periodic collapses, which were avoided in the history of modern Europe. So it seems that the concept of capitalism is used with the intention of making it more restrictive than the concept of a market economy. And so I suppose one way of rephrasing the question is, what subcategory, what subset of market economies count as capitalism? Now, Karl Marx uh, believed that one of the most important attributes of capitalism is that under capitalism, labor is bought and sold. Labor becomes a commodity. The workers are deprived of direct access to the means of production. Capital is accumulated by the capitalists who provide them with access to the means of production. And there is a relentless logic of accumulation driven by the profit motive. Uh, and around this, then, a whole set of other attributes which supposedly all compose a system. Would anyone like to make any other observation about the concept of capitalism before I, before I explore it further? So in Marx, there's this idea that it's a system uh, with these many attributes. 
uh, a whole legal institutional architecture that is built into the idea of capitalism and that is in some sense indivisible. All of its parts stand or fall together. You either replace them all at once or you don't replace them. Moreover, there is a, a characteristic trajectory that leads to this system. So, for example, a process of agrarian concentration, driving the peasants out of the land and thereby depriving them of direct control over the means of production, they become then propertyless workers in the cities, ready to assume their role in the new system. And there is a relation suggested in Marx between this system and a certain moment or stage in the history of production. So capitalism is the system that corresponds to the rise of mechanized manufacturing and later of industrial mass production. And the institutional system described by Marx as capitalism is then supposedly the necessary and sufficient basis for the achievement of this particular stage in the evolution of the productive forces of society. Now, everyone or many people use the concept of capitalism who are not Marxists. And so we have to ask further, what do they mean? Uh, very few of them may believe in this whole social theoretical setting of the concept of capitalism, but they continue to use the term. So it seems that uh, often what people now mean by capitalism is it is the market economy that developed in early modern Europe in the West and that then began to be diffused throughout the world. That form of the market order began to be diffused. And in the process of being diffused, some of the elements that compose this system, this supposedly indivisible system, began to be deconstructed and replaced. The trajectory of productive evolution was often different from what it was in the West, in early modern Europe. And it turned out that there were other institutions that could sustain that same level of productive achievement of mechanized manufacturing or industrial production. So there's a kind of strange reversal. In Marx, the concept of capitalism looks forward to the construction of this system. As used now most commonly, it seems to refer to this particular unique historical arrangement that came from the modern West and to its subsequent deconstruction. So then you can begin to ask, well, how much can it be deconstructed and still remain capitalism? Like asking, when can a man declare to be bald, be declared to be bald? Uh, so its concept, its, its significance now becomes vague. And this, you could generalize this point about a series of concepts that come from Marx including the concept of class conflict, for example, as well as capitalism. They have a precise meaning in the social theoretical context in which they originally operated. But they lose this meaning when taken out of that context. Then they start to become vague. So it's like an, a, a pair of old blue jeans that you put in the washing machine to fade the blue, and it fades more and more and more until it becomes that baby blue that is the object of desire, and you just keep fading it. 
Uh, and that seems to be the status of the concept of capitalism. Uh, so this is the source of immense confusion. And my suggestion is that we should lead the, the, lead the elephant out of the room and get rid of this concept because we don't know what it means. Uh, the, its, its rhetorical significance seems to be, by the people who use it, to, to, to suggest that it's not just the market economy. It's the market economy plus something. But what exactly the plus is, is not defined. That's the problem. Uh, so then there is this insinuation of some larger significance of institutional and political meaning, which remains undefined. And that then is a source of intellectual equivocation or self-deception. So I have a specific proposal. Let's get rid of it. Uh, and that's the end of my discussion of the concept of capitalism. <laughs> let, me, let, 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 me, let me stop, the, though, before I go any further and ask whether any of you would like to make a comment about this proposal of mine. Yes. What do you mean, the drive to accumulation driven by profit? Is that what you mean? And then how that economism gets translated into the political domain itself. It translates it into what domain? Yeah, so that's, so, and of course what's happened in the history of Western Marxism has been an emphasis on the relative autonomy of both politics and culture from the rigid form of the Marxist system. So in general, what the neo-Marxists have done is they have diluted Marx's original claims, watering them down without replacing them. And that goes in the direction of my metaphor of the blue jeans that are put in the washing machine. So I don't see that as contradicting either my critical reflection just now or the consequence that I want to draw from it, which is let's get rid of it because it's a source of confusion. Now, once we have led the elephant out of the room. Before you completely, yes. uh, let me add a, yes. a, a point before yes. you move on. Uh, because uh, I think it, 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 it's, um, it's useful to ask what would a contemporary economist say about your proposal to um, remove uh, capitalism from the discussion? Um, you might think that economists would be the defenders uh, of this um, idea, not of course in its Marxist variant, but uh -huh. um, in their um, uh, sort of in, as, as their primary object of study. Yes. Um, but uh, in fact, in economics, capitalism does not occupy uh, any important um, space. You can go through an entire economics PhD program and never en encounter the term capitalism. Yes. Um, if you ask a professional economist, what is capitalism? Um, first answer would be a sort of long silence. If you force them to say something, they probably would say something like it's a combination of a, a market economy, so emphasis on markets, uh -huh. uh, with um, uh, emphasis on a system of private property ownership. So capitalism abstractly would be a combination of a system where the means of production um, are mostly private, so they would say it's mostly privately owned economy. Yes. And where uh, economic relationships are mostly mediated uh, through markets. Yes. Uh, without obviously sort of the normative connotations of either yes. Marx or, or, or capitalism as a system of yes. power and so forth. Uh, 
but they would come to this only kind of like uh, you know uh, on you know upon duress. Um, so Reluctantly, it's, 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 it's not. And then if you ask them a little bit, um, if you ask them a little bit more, but that's sort of way you know very abstract. Um, and sort of can you say a little bit more about what capitalism actually looks like? then they would talk about it um, in the context of the specific institutional arrangements that exist in yes. a particular context, most likely um, you know, 21st, early 21st gen century or late 20th century United States or something like that, yes. talking about you know, some of the arrangements of um, a, 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 a kind of a US-like uh, economy. Yes. Um, and then you can ask questions, is, is China a capitalist economy? Or um, is, um, is uh, um, Zimbabwe a, a capitalist economy? And, and you know, sort of there's, there are no tools within economics to really um, handle this, this question. So that, that sort of basically suggests also that you, know, you don't need to have your perspective. You can easily come to this question from uh, of course. A, a, a thoroughly um, uh, sort of um, uh, neoclassical economic perspective and say that you know the notion of capitalism is not particularly useful mm. and then the whole issue becomes we'll focus presumably on a market economy and different types of a market uh -huh. economy and then what are the institutional bases of a market economy are the relevant yeah. questions well I fully understand that and I think that one of the messages given by the people who use the concept of capitalism is they say we're going to use the instruments of economics, but with a progressive or critical intention. That is, most people who use the concept of capitalism are suggesting uh, some, ki some kind of tension with it. Not always the case. Uh, and so it's useful to go back to the distinction I made in an earlier class between three types of economics by the criterion of the institutional ideas. So there's pure economics, as in marginalism and general equilibrium theory, that makes no institutional assumptions and has no institutional commitments. It doesn't need this concept of capitalism at all. Then there's what I call fundamentalist economics, which identifies economic rationality with the market and the market with a particular set of institutional arrangements like Hayek and so forth, uh, and or in the United States, the, the disciples of, of, of Friedman. Uh, and they sometimes use the concept of capitalism, reversing the Marxist intention and using it as a term of approbation. It's a defense of the established institutional arrangements of the market order. And then there's a third kind of economics, which I call the equivocating economics as illustrated that's, that's me right yes well i'm not <laughs> suggesting that you would do that danny but uh, the equi as the the as illustrated by the the analytic and argumentative practice of the american disciples of keynes so-called macroeconomics remember what is macroeconomics macroeconomics is the downsized version of keynesianism transformed into the theory of fiscal and monetary policy and superimposed on the pre-existing body of economic theory, which was then redubbed microeconomics. And so what started out as at least the beginning of a rivalry of theoretical paradigms ended up as the coexistence of two chapters in the same textbook. So those people then can claim to explore law-like regularities among large-scale economic aggregates, such as the level of saving or, or the level of inflation and the level of employment, the Phillips curve. And then you object and you say, well, that depends on a host of institutional conditions, whether how labor is organized, whether there's unemployment insurance, what's the form of it, and so forth. If you change any of those background economic conditions, then this so-called regularity, this law which you're seeking to establish would no longer hold. And what's likely to happen then in that debate 
is that the macroeconomist concedes. But if in practice the institutional situation is stagnant in the society, then he can disregard his concession and go back to what he was doing before. That's what I'm calling the equivocating economics. Now, uh, back then to the central line of discussion. The alternative institutional forms of the market economy, unclouded by the dubious concept of capitalism. The premise, the, the, the negative analytical premise, is that a market order has no single natural and necessary institutional and legal form. To establish this thesis was the main analytical achievement of legal theory in the 150 years from the middle of the 19th century to the end of the 20th century. And it was a surprising analytical achievement because it was brought about by jurists who, for the most part, intended to demonstrate the opposite. That is, they intended to demonstrate that the market order, the free economy, was a system, a single package, and they proved the opposite. The way in which this happened is that when they started to infer the details of the market order from the general categories of private property and freedom of contract, and go down the ladder of concreteness. At each step down the ladder, they found that there were choices to be made. And that the answer to these choices could not be established by inferring back from the abstract idea of the market. The choices in each case turn on conflicts of interest and conflicts of vision. Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example, that's what he stands for. So the, the result is that there is no system. And that simple idea that a market order has no single natural and necessary form has to this day not yet penetrated fully the inner sanctum of much of our practical economic and policy discussion. It remains an unassimilated analytic achievement. So it because but this negative analytic thesis is relevant to us in our programmatic discussion if we come to think that the focus of the ideological debate today is no longer or should no longer be the market versus the state, but rather the alternative institutional forms of the market order not how much market versus how much state, but which market. And that that's part of a broader discussion in which you would say the focus of the ideological debate are the alternative institutional forms of a market economy, of a democratic government, or, and of an independent civil society. The alternative institutional forms of economic, political and social pluralism. That's the emerging ideological debate in the world. Now, from that standpoint, then, we can put the general question, the central question of our course. How should we think about the, al the alternative institutional futures of the market order? And I propose then to sketch a simple set of ideas exploring that in three dimensions. So the first dimension is the relation of the market to the state and the extent to which the state can partner and can experiment. The second dimension is the relation among the private agents themselves. And the third dimension is the nature of the access of the private agents to the means of production, Marx's great theme. So first, the state. <coughs> 
Roberto, before yes. you go on, I think it might be useful just to, if I can ask you to elaborate on something that yes. um, it was a critical point that you make, that, that legal theory has dismantled the notion that, um, that the institutional underpinnings or institutional foundations of a market economy are unique, that there is a unique set of institutional yes. arrangements that make up a market economy. Yes. And you mentioned property rights in passing. I think it might be useful for you to say a little bit more about, because I think this is one of the, th this is a notion that um, many people find it surprising unless it, it's sort of unpacked. So people, when you speak, so you, when you say, okay, market economy requires property rights, and that seems to be like property rights seem to be like one thing. Um, it's I own something. I have rights of ownership. If somebody violates those property rights, I can take them to court. Yes. But you're saying, of course, is that when you peel that layer, um, as you put it, that there are so many different questions that need to be answered with regard to what that right of ownership actually yes. means, that it actually, you be traveling down each one of those, uh, you know, questions in that decision tree, you might have actually, a, you know, multitudes of types of almost infinite varieties. It might be maybe maybe focusing specifically on property rights, for example. You know, can you say a little bit more about what? Well, that I was intending to come to that to come in my back. third okay. domain, but I will anticipate okay. part of the discussion. Okay. But and, and let me so. say, you know, an economist would say the property right. Economists also have had difficulty with the notion of a property right. I think probably the, the reigning view of what a property right today in economics would be something like, you know, um, a. a um, you know, residual control rights. So that is to say that for, you know, everything that is not restricted by pre-existing laws and pre-existing contracts, um, the property right owner has the ability to exercise that residual right of uh, control uh, given any sort of range of, of uh, you know, uncertainty or outcomes. So that is a kind of, you know, anything that is not pre proscribed by existing contracts or, or legal requirements. So if I own a feed of, you know, a land, um, you know, existing laws might say I might not kill anybody. Okay, that constraints on what I can do on my land or, you know, existing regulations might say I might not be able to cut down all my trees or I might not be able to pollute. So I don't exercise those rights. But, you know, uh, you know having accepted all those pre-existing restrictions, I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want. So in that sense, that would be sort of the analytical eco economist uh -huh. version of property rights. But so for the moment, let me just say this. So the way that a jurist thinks about property is that property is a bundle of powers. And it is, anom it is an anomaly in the history of law, in the world history of law, for these powers to be all together invested in the same right holder, the owner. In most periods of legal history, in most legal traditions, these powers have been disassembled and vested in different kinds of owners. Of course, feudalism is an obvious case, but it's the normal situation in property. So in the civil law, the most widespread legal tradition in the world, we think of three main powers that compose property. There's use, there's usufruct, which is the control of the income stream, and then there's the power to alienate, to buy and sell. And they can go together or not in all sorts of ways. And so sometimes, so when, pro when property is described as just a bundle of powers or a bundle of relations, the objection is sometimes made that it's not just an amorphous bundle. It has a particular shape. And that's always true. So the point about the bundle idea is not that property is shapeless, but that it can have alternative shapes. That's the point. Alternative defined shapes. And now I can explain a little further by going back to a remark I made in our very first class about the abstract idea of the market, the market at the highest level of generality or abstraction. I said then, a market taken to this most abstract level has at least two dimensions. 
One dimension is the absolute level of economic decentralization. That is, the number of economic agents who can bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. The second dimension is the degree of control that each of those agents has over the resources at his command. Is it absolute? Is it perpetual? Or is it conditional, temporary, and fragmentary in some way? And a common mistake in the conventional thinking about property is to believe that these two dimensions go naturally and necessarily together. They don't. In fact, there is an obvious tension or even a contradiction between them. We might, for example, be able to increase the absolute level of economic decentralization by diminishing the absolute and perpetual character of the control that the individual agents have over those resources, creating property rights that are conditional or partial or temporary in some way, as I am going to illustrate later on in the discussion. So that's just by way of a kind of minimal analytical background to this idea, to this negative thesis that the market order has no single natural and necessary form. So now let's begin with these three domains. So the first domain is the market and the state and the way in which the state can experiment and can partner. So the state can partner with economic agents. Uh, and there can be different models of government business relations. So in an earlier class also I said, we have now available in the world two main models of government business relations. We have the American model of the arm's length regulation of business by government. And we have the Northeast Asian model of the formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. But we could have a third model. We could have a form of coordination or partnership between the state and private agents that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. So instead of having a single trade in industrial policy, we experiment with various directions, and we allow a whole range of agents, a, a, a varied cast of characters, intermediate between the state and the firms to participate in this pluralistic experiment. And we can relate that to proposals that Danny has made in the, some of the readings assigned for today about industrial policies related to, the, to production, production-oriented or production-focused, or not pre-production or post-production. And we can relate it more generally to one of the themes of our earlier classes of this attempt to lift up the productive periphery and to develop a 21st century equivalent to 19th century agricultural extension. So that requires an institutional innovation. So that's an example then of the, the, the state, the reinvention of the state and the way in which the state interacts with the private agents beginning to reshape the market order. Now, the state can also partner with independent civil society in the experimental provision of public services. So, for example, what we have mainly in the world today by way of provisions, provision of public services is a kind of administrative Fordism. It's the, it's the provision of standardized, low-quality public services by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. What I mean by calling them low-quality is that they are of lower quality than equivalent services 
that might be bought on the market by someone who has money. And it appears at first that the only alternative to that administrative Fordism is the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. But there is another alternative, which may become increasingly significant in the course of the 21st century. And that is for the state to, the, the, the state assures a, a minimum floor of universal free public services. And the state may also operate at the ceiling in the development of the costliest, most innovative, and most complex public services. But in the broad middle zone between the floor and the ceiling, the state might partner with independent civil society, organized through cooperatives, uh, for example, health providers or educators, to partner with the state, not for profit, in the experimental provision of public services. And that might be one of the best ways to enhance their quality. Now, then the third area of this state experimentalism would regard the state itself, not the private agents of the economy, the firms, nor civil society, but itself internally. And let me then explore this in the context of federalism. So then we imagine society goes down a certain track. But as it goes down a certain track, it hedges its bets by allowing parts of itself to generate counter models of the national future. And that would be one of the uses of federalism. So at a first stage, the federalist experimentation can take the form of cooperation, vertical cooperation among the three levels of a federal system, and horizontal cooperation among states and among towns. And then we could say there would be a second stage of more radical experimentation in which parts of a country would apply for what you could call rights of wide divergence. Because in a federal system, the default presumption is that all parts of the country enjoy the same right of divergence at the same time. And if they all have to have the same right of divergence, you can't imagine that any one of them would be able to diverge very far. You can imagine a system in which a part of a country applies for the right to diverge very far. It would have to be vetted politically and judicially to prevent the divergence from being an instrument of abuse. But that's what the idea would be. Now, it's interesting that this experimentalism in the relation between the center and the local or the periphery applies to unitary states and not just to federal systems. Unitary states like the United Kingdom or France. And in fact, it may be easier to develop in unitary states because in unitary states, there isn't this presumption that everyone enjoys the same level of the right of divergence. So the government of the United Kingdom, for example, can make a deal with Scotland that is different from the deal that it makes with Wales. So it's easier then for there to be this divergence in a unitary state than in a federal system. So there you have one set of changes in the market order. Now, the second set of changes regards the relation among private agents. And so one way of thinking about the focus of these changes is that they have to do with the relation between cooperation and competition. So one of the characteristics of the most advanced forms of production is that they thrive on the basis of what we call cooperative competition. Cooperative competition means the economic agents are independent. 
they may have an independent economic base, an independent property, but they nevertheless cooperate. We have a historical example of that in the 19th century American agriculture. As I said, the Americans established a family-scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes. And one of the bases, in addition to the strategic partnership between the government and the family farmer, was cooperative competition among the family farmers. They were independent proprietors, but they pooled resources to achieve economies of scale. When people compare, for example, different forms of the contemporary knowledge economy, one of the common observations that they make is that the knowledge economy is favored when there is a circulation of people, resources, ideas, and practices among a whole ecosystem of firms. So it's a common observation, for example, about the reason why Silicon Valley is relatively more successful than Route 128 in Boston, because there is a culture of cooperative competition, of, uh, a circulation of resources among people. Now, what is the legal device of co cooperative competition? The legal device of the primary legal device of cooperative competition is the relational contract. So in the law of contract, the standard law of contract, the model of a contract is the bilateral executory promise. A fully articulated bargain among strangers at a distance for an exchange of performances at some instantaneous moment in the future. The relational contract is an open-ended, incomplete bargain for a series of collaborations in the future. So it's not fully bargained out. That's one difference. And second, its true object is itself. That is the, the development of the relation. And there isn't a, an instantaneous exchange of performances. There are a series of benefits, of open-ended benefits imagined in the future. So we can imagine a market order in which the relational contract, an incomplete agreement, becomes increasingly central and displaces the centrality or primacy of the bilateral executory promise. But there's another way of thinking about this change. And the other way of thinking is not the contrast between the fully articulated bargain and the relational contract. It's the contrast between a network of contracts and an organization or a firm. So a common way of thinking about a firm is that it is a network of contracts. But this is not an entirely accurate description, because in the legal theory of the firm, the management enjoys a residual power to discipline labor, which can never be fully contractualized. And that creates a difference between a contract, any contract, and a firm. Now, we can imagine a market order in which, instead of there being this radical contrast between the isolated individual and the firm, there is a continuum. And the firm is simply a limiting case. But there are a whole range of ways in which people collaborate, they produce together. Uh, the relational contract may be a moment in that collaboration, but they don't come together in a business organization, in a firm. So the firm then, rather than being the natural form of organization, becomes the limiting case. So cooperative competition and the relativization of the distinction between the firm and the independent economic agents.
Now let me take the third domain. The third domain is the access of the independent economic agents to the means of production. Marx's great, great, great theme. And here we come back to our discussion of property. Because the main legal device of this access of the economic agent to the means of production is property. Now, there's no natural form of property, as I said earlier in, in, our, in our discussion. Property can have different forms, and we can imagine different regimes of private and social property coexisting experimentally in the market order. Why should a market order be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself? Why cannot we translate this idea of the market into alternative institutional arrangements that coexist experimentally in the same market economy? So there'll always be room for classic private property because the unified property right, this traditional 19th century invention, has a great practical advantage. The great practical advantage of unified property is that it allows the owner, an entrepreneur, to do something that no one else believes in at his own risk without having to negotiate some set of agreements or vetoes. So that's what Frank Knight, a conservative economist, said was the historical justification of capitalism. He used the term capitalism in the tradition of Friedman. He said, the historical justification of capitalism is the existence of a class of people willing to pay a premium for the privilege of running a risk. So that's the, that's the justification for having private property, classic private property, as one of the elements of this new market order. But it shouldn't be the only one. So we can imagine a whole range of fragmentary forms of property that allow different tiers of stakeholders, workers, local communities, local governments, to have superimposed claims on the same productive resources. And that then is a different architecture of the legal access to the means of production. Now, if we were to proceed in that direction further and further, we might ultimately come to the following idea, which I state now just as a thought experiment. The idea is the idea of a running capital auction. So you say, many of the major productive assets of society are vested in independent public trusts. It's not discretionary allocation by the government. And Anyone can use those resources who is able to assure the trust for, for a certain period of time of the highest rate of return. So that there is this running capital auction, and, that, and, and then the underlying rate of interest for the use of those assets becomes the main form of public finance instead of taxation. So that would be a completely different market order. Now, it is curious that, in a sense, the orthodox theory of finance seems to suggest that the existing economy already is that running capital auction. Because, after all, a fully competitive capital market is supposed to allocate resources to their most productive use. So, for example, when there was that disorganized so-called spontaneous privatization in the Russia of the 1990s, people said it doesn't matter who the first buyers are because the assets will ultimately end up in the hands of their most productive uses. That was the justification. So it's like claiming that these defective, flawed institutional forms already anticipate the practical advantage of the running capital auction that I've just described. Well, there you have it. You have three directions of institutional and legal innovation in the form of the market economy that 
Each of them can go, can go further or less far. They're not blueprints. They suggest different ways in which we can begin to deconstruct and reconstruct the institutional form of the market order. Now, there's just one more proposal I want to make. Uh, so that these ideas can compose a larger programmatic vision. Uh, all of this is the description of a heightened experimentation in society. Let's call that experimentation the storm. So we want the storm. The storm is innovation for people like us who want to affirm the primacy of structural change but want not to succumb to a structural dogmatism. That's the point. But for this storm to achieve the effect that we want, the individual, the individual citizen and worker must be secure in a haven of vital protected interests and safeguards and of endowment insuring rights. So a fuller version of the programmatic vision would say the storm and its institutional presuppositions are not enough. There must be the storm and there must be the haven. And it's the relation between the haven and the storm that's crucial. So what is the legal form of the haven? It's the basic rights, a minimum guaranteed income, a social inheritance. Everyone gets a certain minimum of resources from the state rather than a few inheriting from their families and so forth. What's strange about historical social democracy is that it has no discourse about the storm. It has only a discourse about the haven. And of course, the haven means something very different. If we fail to think of it, as the enabling condition for the storm. So this is the fundamental idea of our basic rights. So I say to a child, for example, I love you unconditionally, independently of what you do. Or you, you are secure in my love. Now go out and raise a storm in the world. That's the fundamental logic of the relation between the, ha the haven and the storm. We tell the individual, Workers who said, be unafraid, like the Seraph Abdiel in Paradise Lost, unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified, so that you can thrive in the storm. And that then is the fundamental message of, this, of these ideas. Great. So um, I, I think those are three very important uh, directions that, that you've outlined. Uh, in terms of um, areas for experimentation that would greatly enlarge um, the scope and the range of market economies we can, we can, we can envisage. Um, I, I think I want to, um, I, I'm going to ask you one, que uh, one question for clarification, but I think it might be useful to then open it up yes. for, for discussion and, and questions, and then I'll, I'll come back. Um, so what the, the, the one thing I wanted to ask you, I think it was implicit, but I think it might be useful for you to be explicit about that too. The relation between our earlier discussion of uh, technology in the knowledge economy and uh, these various directions. I assume some of it stands on its own, but some of it is actually tightly related to the possibilities that these, the new knowledge economy affords us. You mean like saying that the that the state should 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 favor the technologies that enhance labor rather than the technologies that replace labor? Well, uh, more broadly, that I think some of the possibilities of uh, different forms of relational contracting, for example, sure. your, under your second heading um, of um, sort of various different forms of interactions among firms uh, that that we see already that that is actually informed by what's happening in, you know, in, at, in the vanguard economy, in of Silicon course, Valley, because and, 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 and that, that once we get away from mass production, for example, 
uh, that we don't need to confine ourselves to these hierarchical firms, internal yes. production, um, Fordism, uh, that we can envisage um, many different forms of production. And, 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 uh, so and the uh, basic idea is that technology is not self-directing. It's not an autonomous force that has its own inherent logic, its own inherent dynamic. It depends on us. And we can shape its evolution. So that was true even of the technologies of mass production. They took a particular form that was adapted to the controlling interests of the societies in which they arose. And so now the insular knowledge economy, I said, is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance. It's an adaptation, it's a downsizing of these innovations to the interests of the of our dominant to, to the dominant interest and the entrenched preconceptions. And the result is that the potential of the knowledge economy is shortchanged. Huh? So it has an un underutilized potential. That's what the enemies of the path of least resistance have going for them that they can exploit this underused potential of the innovations. And that would apply then to all of these technological innovations. Let's, let's see if, if questions or comments that want to probe um, any of them. Um, No, so I don't think of it as just an end in itself. So it is also an end in itself in the particular sense that I'm going to describe. But the, the, the particular forms of experimentalism that I outlined serve particular economic and political interests. So uh, the claim is, wh why would we do all of this, this reinvention of the market? One of the reasons why we would do it is to, uh, to advance, to, to promote the, the deepening and the dissemination of the most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy. So that we have a knowledge economy for the many rather than as we have now, just a knowledge economy for the few. And therefore, there is a much wider basis for the rise of productivity and economic growth than there now is. So I would say that's an example of the instrumental use of experimentalism. And, and in, on each of those areas, you could find such an instrumental use. So for example, the argument about the provision of public services is among other things, an argument about the best way to enhance their quality a major theme of the politics of the contemporary democracies. Nevertheless, you are correct that there is a dimension in which the experimentalism is an end in itself. And uh, it's a generalized idea of one of the aspects of freedom. So freedom means, among other things, that we can engage in a particular social order without surrendering to it that we can be insiders and outsiders at the same time, that we can participate while continuing to resist and to revise. So at the most abstract level, we could say there are two classes of moves we can make in the world. There are the routine moves 
that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted, and that are, for the most part, not just unrevised, but even unseen. And then there are the exceptional moves by which, from time to time, we cha challenge and change parts of that fr framework, typically under the provocation of crisis. Now, if we could bring these two classes of moves closer together, so that our revisionary activities arise more continuously from the normal business of life, rather than depending on the enabling circumstance of crisis, we would be freer and greater and more prosperous. So in that sense, experimentalism is an end in itself. Yes? Yes. In the Hall of Poetry's reading, it was also argued that it was the misuse of high insurgency uh, in Grand Bahamian and short term pressures in financial markets um, and other aspects of their you know, ideal type of global market economy, that that was a complementary to the bilateral executive contract. Yes. So you're, so you're quite right to present this, this, this question. So the, 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 the moral culture of production changes in a particular direction. And the general direction is a heightening of the level of discretionary initiative and of reciprocal trust allowed and required of all participants in the process of production. So. And, and that depends, in some sense, on sh some, some, some sharing of, of perspective. Now, the vital question sociologically and politically is, does this higher level of sharing depend on some antecedent consensus? Or is it, can it itself be the result of an initiative? Can we reshape? the level of social capital, of associational density? Can we make it an object of our deliberate intervention? And I believe we can. And that in these societies, more generally, the principle should be the multiplication of new forms of collective action in which people do things together that they didn't do before. And so we think of this sharing of purpose as arising from collective action rather than of collective action depending on an antecedent sharing of purpose created by some form of tribalism in society. So it, it, it is undoubtedly an aspiration to a certain form of moral progress in society, which we then hope will be related to this economic flourishing. There's a question back there. Yes. Well, uh, so I think the, the, the general description of this system is one in which we are creating many legal institutional bases for the, the democratization of economic opportunity and empowerment. But we're doing that in the spirit that an equality of outcome or circumstance 
is not the aim. So the aim is shared empowerment. And inequality, which we're going to discuss next week, is objectionable only to the extent that it is incompatible with the shared empowerment. So it's an empirical question. Uh, I think the running capital auction that I described is part of a system in which those productive assets would not be perpetually in the control of their present users and not be subject to the hereditary transmission of property. So we interrupt accumulation at least at the point of death. And more broadly, we interrupt it through this decentralization or democratization of economic opportunity. But I agree with you that the, the detailed forms that inequality may take in the future are forms that we can't foresee now. Uh, it will resurface in new forms. And then we'll have to deal with them as it resurfaces. There won't be some kind of perpetual motion machine that will guarantee us against this, these events. Huh? And that is a th that's part of all of my arguments here, right? I mean, I agree with the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead that the business of the future is to be dangerous. And so nothing in these ideas is somehow a way of disposing of the dangers of the future. Yes. Yes. So I wonder about the state. I know that the first point is conceded that you know, the more, uh, let's say, uh, a role of the state that enables expansion, but shouldn't, shouldn't we have a core point in envisioning a new model of the state? So this is not about the state and not about democracy. This is about the market. So if we are to have a discussion of the state, then that's another discussion, and it's related to this one. And there I'm going to argue for a high energy democracy, elevating the temperature of politics, hastening the pace, facilitating the coexistence of strong central initiative and decentralization and so forth. And then Danny is going to object that I keep doubling the bet, uh, and, and that it's all like a system and so forth. But it's really not like a system. It's saying that the further we go in this direction, the more our economic aims will be conditioned or limited by the political situation. And then we'll have to turn from the economic front to the political front and innovate in the institutional arrangements of democracy. So the logic will be the logic of combined and uneven development not the logic of systemic substitution. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, right, this is, this is like the, the, this is what the business school professors say, thinking about worldly wisdom. They say, the problem in the management of business is you have to make people secure and then scare them out of their wits. Uh, and so there's this tension. Uh, but all ways of dealing with that tension are not the same. Uh, and so, so I think that's, that's the point. 
So the objective is not the maximization of security. That's a perversion of historical social democracy. This focus on we're, we're afraid. We're afraid of the market. We're afraid of globalization. We're afraid of this. We're afraid of that. Give them as much security as they need to be able to stand up and to prevail in the storm. So it's a different idea. But it's not an idea of blanket security against all, all changes, all the ravages of the world. That's not the idea. So, so I wonder if there's a, there's one more question. Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Yes. Well, that's what I was indirectly referring to. That is the idea, this idea of the firm as a way of diminishing transaction costs, and the firm as a network of contracts and so forth. The firm is not just a network of contracts. It is a military organization also in its historical reality with this residual right of management to discipline labor. And now we have in these contemporary economies an increasing percentage of the labor force that has attenuated relations to any business organization. So that's, an, that's a different reality. And the suggestion there was, instead of thinking that the natural way of organization is the firm, the firm is just at the end of a spectrum, of a continuum. And there are many ways in which people can come together in entrepreneurial or productive activities without taking these final steps into the firm. And then we see what happens. So I want to say something that, that picks up on sort of various uh -huh. things that we've heard. And, um, and, and, and one caricature of, of this exchange would be that uh, people were sort of, you know, wondering and worrying about sort of, you know, different elements and, and where they might take us and, uh -huh. and what are its, what's the downside and what's the risk. And, and, and your general response being, well, you know, it's, there's nothing certain in life, and, and we, we want a future that's going to be dangerous. That's right. I like and, risk. And, and so, <laughs> so, my, so my, my comment is, is whether you know, that there isn't something missing in this. Um, and, and I think um, I'd like to suggest that, 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 that you're missing a theory of what, what disciplines this process. Because, um, and, and, there, and I will suggest that there might be theories, and I'll give a version or a sketch of one uh -huh. that, that would discipline it. And that would make it a little bit more immune to the criticism but of you know, what is this and what of that, and, 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 and you having some maybe a more reassuring <laughs> response than, don't be afraid, the future <laughs> is dangerous, but uh, <laughs> go boldly into it uh -huh. and, and, and send your children <laughs> behind you. And, and so you have you have to have we have to have some guarantee that you know this is going to end up well <laughs> rather than disastrously and I think that sort of is is, is part of this um, this sense of unease. And well, that, isn't that's isn't what I mean. part of the guarantee to do things little by little, step by step? Because um, then you see what well happens. Then, you know, you, then you, yeah, but even things that you do step by step could have um, quite uh, significant. Um, adverse effects, and then you know we might. And then not you be change direction, anyway. or you correct. Well, yeah, it. yes, but I mean, if, if but, but ideally, you would have a theory of what would discipline this process in a way that you can maybe help design those steps ex ante, uh -huh. that constrain ex ante some of those steps that you should invest in in some time, um, and. And when I mean that, when I said that, I mean that that um, you know there might be such a theory. Is, is uh, you know thinking of it as as, a, as an economist, I think of sort of economist emphasis on um, incentives and on preventing opportunistic behavior in the context of deep uncertainty or or incomplete. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, knowledge and asymmetric information. 
that that set of tools that economists have about thinking about the role of incentives uh, in the context of, of um, uh, asymmetric information actually does help uh, to, to, to think about sort of how you would discipline this process in terms of steps that you want to take, steps you want to avoid. And, and let me give one concrete example of this. It's, it might be something that we'll come back to later in the context of uh, finance. Uh, but, um, and I have in mind the innovations, the institutional innovations that we undertook in the buildup uh, to the mortgage crisis in 2008 and 2009. Because um, the ex ante justification for all the introduction of these um, financial derivatives and um, highly complicated contracts uh, in the context of mortgage lending um, prior to 2008-2009 uh, could have been motivated and justified precisely by the kinds of arguments that you've made. After all, what were those innovations? Um, we went from a system where we had a very traditional uh, system of mortgage lending where you have a bank, uh, a bank you know, lands to local borrowers who will live in houses for very long times. Banks have a lot of information about who's actually borrowing the money and their houses. The actual lending officer knows uh, often in person, sort of highly sort of, you know, traditional kind of, of uh, mortgage lending. And the, the whole theory behind um, sort of this uh, world of, of uh, derivatives and um, and you know CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and the credit default swaps, and all that sort of you know new types of contracts and financial engineering uh, that brought us the crisis was that it was precisely going to decentralize, democratize uh, access to uh, to mortgages and to mortgage borrowing uh, by essentially taking these contracts applying these principles that you know property can be sliced and diced in a number of different ways. So we take these contracts, we you know, break them up into different tranches, uh, we spread them around the world, we make portfolios out of them, uh, and, and, and um, in turn we provide all kinds of new insurance mechanisms, um, we divide up the risk among those who want to bear more risk and those who want to have wow. you know, more insured, more guaranteed returns by having these you know, credit default swaps. Ex ante, just before the crisis struck, if you looked at this, you would have seen, you know, this is an Ungaresque system uh, because, you know, the objective was to democratize finance, uh, lending for, for, and it did. I mean, a lot of people were able to buy No, that wasn't the objective. That was the pretext, right? The objective well, was to make money. Yes, but that's the point. So, no, obviously, uh, but what yeah. you're saying is not incompatible with yes, people I making understand. money. So. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that would not have disciplined the process. Um, and I think now, you know, ex ante, some people saw this, but ex post we can see it better, that we had applied some of the basic tools of economics, yes, economics, um, that to, to sort of understanding how this, what looked like a process of um, divvying up risk and redistributing and distributing it widely and democratizing finance was actually removing the incentives of key people in the system to monitor you know, the, the credit process, to monitor the lenders, to ensure the right kinds of loans were being made, um, and that people who were making these decisions had actually skin in the game. In other words, looking at it from the standpoint of incentives uh, in the context of um, incomplete information, asymmetric uh -huh. information, provides us a way of thinking about some of these institutional innovations, some kinds of financial engineering that we should not have traveled uh, uh, towards, that we should not have done. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only thing that, you know, or necessarily the best way to discipline uh, this, uh, you know, sort of how you think about um, experimentation. I'm just, you know, saying that this would be how I would think. Yes. Uh, about how I would want to discipline this process of experimentation. You might have another theory of what that might be much more political. Political accountability might be another mechanism for disciplining this. But in any case, but you do need a theory of what's going to discipline yes. this. Um, and I didn't hear you provide one. Well, let's, let's take your example of finance, even though it anticipates the discussion of a future week. So 
first of all, just on an analytical point, just so that this idea of the disassembling of property doesn't seem mysterious, the disaggregation of the property right is the generative architectural principle of contemporary financial markets. Financial derivatives, option contracts, are technically, in legal terms, derivatives of the property right. They're fragmentary forms of property. That's the whole basis of contemporary financial markets. And look so where they've gotten us. Yes, exactly. So, so, so a, 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 a device which was intended or proposed as a way of hedging against risk was converted into an instrument of gambling. That's, and, uh, but then you have to look at the details. So for example, option contracts in commodity markets exercise a valid function of increasing liquidity. But it doesn't automatically follow that they perform the same function in, in equity markets, for example, in, in the stock market. That's where they would con convert it into the device of gambling. Now, what is the underlying problem that created this, the basis for this conversion of hedging into gambling? It was the, the inability to to assure that finance would serve the real economy. So there was financial, in, instead of financial deepening, that is the, the, the narrowing of the distance between finance and the productive agenda of society, there was financial hypertrophy. Finance started to use the transactions of the real economy as a pretext rather than as a real target for successive layers of self-directed financial engineering. So if you look at the reform proposals that emerged after the crisis of 2008, and which were all designed by our economist friends, uh, there were four proposals. There was the, re the, the, the attempt to reestablish the old New Deal program of separating proprietary trading from the activities of the banks that had governmentally insured deposits. Then there was a new technocratic agenda of ability by the federal government to liquidate and restructure re re failing financing organizations. Then there was the agenda of the, the international financial elite headquartered in the Bank of International Settlements in Basel to increase the capital adequacy rules of the financial organization. And fourth, there was the consumer protection business, protecting the consumers of financial services. What these four programs had in common is that none of them address the underlying issue of bringing finance closer to the production system, making it less dangerous by making it more useful. Now, all of that was greatly aggravated by another factor, which I find astonishing. The, the dominant regulatory strategy toward finance that developed in the second half of the 20th century was what you could call the strategy of regulatory dualism. And its basis was paternalism. It said there are two sectors of finance. There's the sector used by the general public, depositors, investors, and so forth, which is thickly regulated. And then there's another sector, thinly regulated, which is inhabited by high net worth individuals and financial professionals. They don't need protection. So what happened was entirely predictable. All of the services and products prohibited in the thickly regulated sector were repackaged and relabeled in the thinly regulated sector and smuggled into the thinly regulated sector. So the thinly regulated sector was then used as a subterfuge as a circumvention of the thickly regulated sector. To this day, 
the strategy of regulatory dualism in finance has not been challenged and replaced. It remains in place. So there's the shadow banking, the financial activities of the non-financial organizations and so forth. So I think we have to look in detail at these different things and see what the problem is. I doubt that the conventional theory of incentives will be sufficient to address these problems. Well, again, as I said, maybe it is not incentives, although you know, I think I and a lot of economists would find you know, sort of thinking about uh, incentive compatibility issues as being very critical to uh -huh. how you would think about institu you know, novel institutional arrangements that might uh, work out fine versus those that will not. But I think you know, you, you're not f fully frontally confronting the question, I don't think. I mean, at the one level, you're providing an answer that's sort of very general, which is, or the, you know, well, the I reason- Well, I focused on your example of finance, right? Well, yes, but I mean, but I, yes, but I mean, the response to that was that, oh, the problem was that, um, you know, that finance, the finance wasn't doing the work of society, but that's sort of like, you know, that, no, that was the problem. No, no. So that's, that's, I mean, I mean, they're saying that finance wasn't connected tightly to production. You know, is, you know, no, is so what I would say is, just to restate it, so I would say, just to reverse the sequence. So the first order of business is to challenge regulatory dualism. Because so long as there's regulatory dualism, you can continue to do what's prohibited in the thinly regulated sector. After that, then you have to deal with the larger underlying issue which is the relation of finance to the real economy. By prohibiting or discouraging financial activities that have no colorable relation to the enhancement of productivity and the expansion of output. Okay. As in my no, example I mean, of the option contracts in yeah, the equity market. I mean, you know, uh, you know, spreading home ownership, okay, maybe it wasn't exactly sort of directly enhancing the productivity of society, but you could you know, envisage that as sort of one of an, That's an, what the New an, Deal an, did. an appropriate social goal yeah. uh, was that, you know, that this mechanism, these new contracts, uh, this financial engineering was according to, and you know, one line of argument was precisely, um, uh, you know, had that objective and seemed to be producing that objective. So the original um, New so Deal through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the governmentally sponsored enterprises, did that. And, but then there was the second wave of the securitization of the mortgage market, which then suffered from these from this perversion, from this diversion, that I think should be read against the background of all of these factors that I listed. I know, but so, so, so we understand that all of these are subject to perversions and wrong yes. turns. And, and it, w it would be nice, and I, I think it would be, you know, sort of to, to have a, a more general theory of what would discipline this, um, uh, you know, um, experimentation um, that is not so general, so general that it's not very helpful in the sense that what I mean by that is to say, oh, we shouldn't do this because it doesn't actually connect finance closer to production or closer to society's goals, because that clearly would not have ruled out what was happening in the world of mortgage finance before 2008, 2009. It's, so that doesn't, would not have disciplined it. Nor is it that sort of it's so specific and detailed that has to then expose, link it to all the well, you know, specific developments. The prohibition of regulatory dualism would have disciplined it much more directly than your theory of incentives. Yeah, but the, the, the but, uh, there, but I mean, there's not. I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong in the idea of regulatory dualism inherently. I would say. Uh, I think you know, there is something wrong. Uh, no, the regulat regulatory dualism is an extension of one of your ideas, which is to actually have a floor, right? Some, you know, some minimal set of rules um, that ensures that if you want to operate in that world of finance that's actually safe, here is that safe world. And you know, here is if you want to really take some risks and, and do stuff that's you know, maybe other things will think crazy, you know, go ahead and do that. But then you it's an, ex it's an extension. that are designed for, you, for 
they are ultimately related to transactions of the general public to be controlled by what's done in this special sector. And ex ante they were opening the door to circumvention. Yeah, but ex ante they were not. It, was, it turns out ex post the cost was so high that you know you had to socialize a lot of the risks. Ex ante it was that you know you you bear your own risks. So so it's not like society. So. Um, Come on, guys, help us out here. <laughs> Reconcile this. Yes. And one, one other question here um, is when you're dealing with, you know, paper positioning and of all the different hardware and software that goes into this business, it does matter where you best place stuff, right? Like one one of the main issues that happens here at the end is that when the house of cards fell down, um, one group got bailed. Not the homeowners, not the workers, but the banks, yeah. Exactly, and then on top of that, as you had more and more claims multiply, and if those claims weren't multiplying because different local governments were getting involved in development projects, they were multiplying because people anywhere with no relation to it um, were grabbing and pushing yes. things for no particular reason. So it, it seems like the, the level of generality of the theory hard to pin down here because it's such a you know particular example but I think if you if you provide the principle of you know focusing on if, if you're giving this goal of democratizing <coughs> particular elements of the market economy you know democratizing has this particular meaning it doesn't necessarily preclude institutions it does have this people centered meaning um, and you can think at each moment Yes. Well, so first of all, let me take a step back. So the idea is not that the whole market order is going to be transformed into this model of disaggregated property. Because I, as I said at the outset, uni traditional unified property has a valid function. It's rather that we're no longer going to fasten the market to the single version of itself. Instead of conceiving economic freedom as simply freedom to recombine the factors of production within an unchanged framework of production and change. We're going to say that there can be innovation in the framework accompanying the evolution of the market economy. It's a higher level of economic freedom. And in a sense, it's a radicalization of the idea of the market, subject to all sorts of risks and misadventure, but some of them could be calculated or expected. I think that the securitization of the more, the, the consequences of the securitization of the mortgage market were relatively predictable and should have been predicted. Uh, and from the consequences of this ability to circumvent that we were, that we were just discussing. So, so, I mean, one of the the the, the restraints you, ma you 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 mentioned as you were discussing um, these various experiments in passing, without getting into the substance of it, was, for example, in the context of a unitary state, that you know part of the the nation might want to go in one direction, um, and you 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 imply that this wouldn't be completely a free for all, that there would have to be you know some set of conditions under which um, that no, is more than that, that because we know from history including American history that states rights rights to devolution can be abused as instruments for the entrenchment of group privileges and group persecution so the exercise of this right to devolution has to be vetted doubly by the political branches of government and then the jurists, the judges, the courts, have to develop standards that can discipline it also. So what, what might those standards be? So they're standards designed to prevent abuse. 
like the standards that developed under in equal protection doctrine and so forth. Right, so I guess that's the kind of thing that I'm asking. So when I'm asking for a theory of what would restrain that, it, 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 it's, it's that, you know, you know, I'm asking for a set of principles uh, that some of them might be quite clear cut that, you know, you don't want, as you said, as in your state's rights example, you don't want part of the nation to go its own way so it can abuse the rights of a minority. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but that's sort of the obvious case. Uh, but, there, but that's just, um, you know, an example of, of, you know, a broader range of restraints, it seems yeah. to me, that, that we have to have. Again, to put it again, I mean, I think there has to be a way of thinking about um, what's going to uh, um, discipline experimentation. Um, and uh, in the absence of that, um, and, and the answer cannot be, don't be afraid of the future. You know. So it's, it's no, it but I think those turn on particular debates. Uh, they, for example, the debates about race and class in the United States. Yeah, but I mean, again, you have to have, you know, so, you, the, but the idea is you provided a lot of examples of a general theory about the, the, uh -huh. the, the, the non-uniqueness of, uh, you know, uh, market supporting institutions or, or the idea that the market does not have a unique natural form. There has to be a, a counterpart to sort of what is the, the scope conditions for this. Um, that is, or that, or that, you know, so that. So a very fundamental thing, uh, which I think is in a sense more fundamental than the, what the theory of incentive suggests, is the contradiction of democracy to class. These societies in which the market order exists and in which the flawed democracies of today exist are class societies. And a class society is incompatible with a democracy. Uh, and so there has to be some way of dealing with the problem that is addressed to that tension. So the way in which the European societies resolved this tension was by filling their constitutions with promises of rights. So entirely bereft of any institutional machinery by which to implement these rights. So that's the kind of thing that has to be addressed. So for example, to take a concrete example, affirmative action. So in the United States, what prevails is the separation of race from class. Race is considered a threshold issue to be addressed before class. And the consequence is a way of dealing with the racial issue that generates benefits in inverse proportion to the need for them. So it establishes a black professional and business class, but it is less useful to the black working class of public employees and not useful at all to the mass of underclass workers who fill the prison and the secondary part of the labor market. So there should be an alternative, and the alternative should be individualized racial discrimination should be criminalized as it is in many countries, but the collective promotion of the disadvantage has to be based on real disadvantage, not on categorical assumptions about who is disadvantaged on the basis of race. And that leads to a different way of thinking. So I think that if you, that, that to me a fundamental source of these ideas about how to discipline the experimentation is the, the dismantling of the realities of class in these market, market economies and democracies that continue to be class societies. Uh, and that's a very particular task that has practical implications as I just illustrated with respect to the racial program. Also? Awesome.
But at the beginning of your statement, you, you, you introduced another theme, which is the theme of the moral culture of the market and of production. And this is a theme which we haven't, I think, developed adequately yet in our conversation here. So mass production, the previous advanced practice of production, and the conventional idea of the market have something in common. What they have in common is that they're based on low trust, on the generalization of a modicum of low trust among strangers. Max Weber and Zimmel, Georg Zimmel, both thought that one of the fundamental moral conditions of, quote, capitalism was that instead of the radical distinction between the high standard given to people who were in the in-network and strangers, these societies develop a universalization of low trust among strangers. So one way of defining the, the, the market economy is a market economy is a simplified form of cooperation among strangers that is unnecessary when there is high trust and impossible when there is no trust. So it is a simplified form of cooperation that thrives on the basis of low trust. And similarly, a mass production firm or factory is a control and command and control system which presupposes low trust and thus these residual powers of management and so forth. The forms of production and organization that we've been considering all presuppose a heightening of the level of reciprocal trust. Uh, and so that is a momentous change in the moral culture of production and the nature of the market economy. A relational contract, disaggregated property, they all presuppose more trust, more collaborative action. And where, where will the moral currency or moral basis for that come from? And that was this argument we were having that it comes from the multiplication of forms of collective action in society. So I think that what I would say, going back to Danny's question about the orienting principle, I would say on the negative side, uh, squarely facing the contradiction of class order to the principles of the market and of democracy. And then on the positive side, uh, creating the mechanisms that generate this heightening of the level of trust, which is the basis for the advanced forms of production and of politics. So one, one issue that we haven't talked much about, but I think it's, it's part of the, of the difficulty here is, is how you move from one system to another. I think it's fine to say that it's incremental, but I think we both would accept that there are a set of complementarities, uh, some system-like elements that might make uh, even small-scale movements in one direction rather difficult in the absence of complementary, ch complementar complementary changes elsewhere. So I think this discussion, for example, of low trust versus high trust environments is, is one example of that. How do you move from a low trust to a high trust environment? I find it useful to think when I'm thinking of institutions as thinking of, of a simple you know, traffic examples. Because if you think about institutions and it's, you know, the definition of institution, its broadest form as, as a rules of the game, a, a kind of a, you know, think about a traffic intersection where you need some rules in order to coordinate behavior. A bunch of cars and pedestrians, cars, trucks, bicycles are all coming in. And you need to set a certain set of rules about you know, who has priority, who's going to stop, and so forth. This is a very simple kind of coordination um, issue. And you can think of two sets of institutions to operate in that traffic intersection. Uh, one would be, um, and, and these have sort of you know, loose relationship to the low trust versus high trust, or relational contracting versus standard contracting kind of, of, of examples. So one rule is, you, you know, the traffic light rule. You know, you put a traffic light, um, you know, if it's red, you stop, and those who face green will pass. This is in some sense a kind of, uh, you know, a low trust environment where there is a kind of, all you need to do is, is look at the traffic light and, and you do it. 
once people have internalized this, which is what I'm going to come to, the difficulty. But sort of the equivalent of relational contracting or high trust, high, or high trust environment is actually when you don't have traffic lights, but there's a sort of internalized norms about who has priority, you know, who will come in. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, videos on, on YouTube, and actually in my lecture notes for this week, you can find a couple of them where, you know, traffic intersections um, in Southeast Asia without traffic lights, but traffic moves nonetheless without necessarily a lot of experiments. Now, if you're a foreigner, you have no idea what to do in those environments because you have not internalized the norms about, you know, who moves first and who slows down, who has, you know, priority. But the traffic flows, so you avoid the, the inefficiencies of having to stop when you face a red light, even though nobody else might be crossing the street. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, but, so, it, you know, so I, I, I liken this to it's kind of a relational contracting kind of environment where because people are dealing with each other on a kind of a repeated basis, the rules are implicit. They have not been written down. In fact, people couldn't probably wouldn't be able to write it down. Right. So, the, 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 so the, the issue here is if you're moving, let's say, you know, from an equilibrium where you didn't have a traffic light, you put a traffic light, even then, you're going to face a problem because in the transition, you're going to have a lot of people who are actually still operating according to the previous rules. And just because they're facing a red doesn't mean they're going to stop. Whereas if there are people facing a green, will necessarily always speed up, then you'll get a lot of accidents because some proportion of people are operating according to the old rules, some are operating. So the question is how do, you know, how quick, quickly do you move from one equilibrium, one set of rules, to the second set of rules? How do you change the ideas in people's minds about what the expected rules but, of the game is? Danny, I think and I'll just say one more yeah. thing here. And I think that's, a lot of that has to do with the question of, you know, sort of the new rules that you are instituting or are trying to institute. What are some of the other complementary background conditions which might be suitable to that rule? So for example, if you put a traffic light, you know, where you know, there is, you know, there are where the red takes, you know, you know, five minutes to turn into green. You know, that's just not going to work, you know, because people are not going to stop at that intersection for five minutes without crossing. So you know that that's not going to work. So, but what I'm struggling for is our need to understand precisely what the background conditions or the disciplining yeah. uh, 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 conditions but would I be for us to contemplate. But I think in historical circumstance is an obvious answer to your initial question. Your, your question is, how do we start? And the answer is, we start with what we've already done. So in these examples that I gave in the three domains, those that have to do with the state, several of them already exist in fragmentary form. The relational contracts, for example, the biotech firms are already collaborating through relational contracts in, in, in the knowledge economy. I'm so always like I'm that's I'm an I'm invention. I right? No, no, exactly, and, and I'm with you, and that's what gives us hope that, uh -huh. you know, because we're not talking about pie in the sky. But what we're often talking about is either scaling these up from where they exist yeah. or to moving them to places where they don't exist. And that's the theory that we're missing. We need to understand why they have not scaled up, why venture capital is only 1% of you know, total finance and not you know, 50%, and why venture capital isn't operating in... You so, know, in for example, to go back to the European example, there are these networks of small and medium-sized advanced firms in certain regions of Europe. And it has been established that on the whole, those are the regions with dense traditions of pre-Fordist craft production. Pre-Fordism favors post-Fordism. So then the, there's a concrete problem. How in the other regions of Europe do we establish the missing functional equivalent to the pre-Fordist conditions of post-Fordism. So there's always going to be an exercise of that kind that we're going to perform in these transformations. Exactly. We're going to find what, what already happened and, and how can we reproduce the equivalent to the conditions that favored that happening in the other regions where it hasn't happened yet. That's absolutely right. I mean, that's, that, that's, I agree with that. Good.
One final question or comment. How fast? How fast can you make it? Danny's not going to like my answer. I'm going to say as fast as we can. <laughs> but yours is specifically about climate change, right? So we, uh, we'll talk about that. We have a session on, on environment climate change. So that's, we've run out of time. So let, let's postpone that for that discussion. Good discussion, don't you think? Excellent. What?